What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the episode <clears throat> on accountability. For those of our faithful that have been plowing through these episodes with us, you have probably noticed I've ended, I think, three, maybe four of the episodes so far with coming up next on the next episode of the Gorilla Social Work Podcast, accountability. And then that's failed to happen, so... I can only chalk that up to the fact that I'm a person who's flawed and I'm, one of those flaws is that I'm unorganized. So it is what it is. You just, you you embrace it. That's all you do. So I don't know where I'm going with this. But yeah, this episode, so we're talking about accountability on this one. It's a good episode, so stay tuned. Um, as always... The Gorilla Social Work Podcast is brought to you by Alpha Counseling and Treatment, who provides individual, group, and family counseling services. Alpha Counseling and Treatment, providing emotional strength for a better living. If you want more information and you are in, on, or around the great state of Utah, check out the website at utahsbesttherapy.com. All right, so we are set. Stay tuned, or we are going to get into accountability. Suck, dude. Play it again, though. <laughs> <laughs> I really was sweating when we were listening. To it. Oh my god, that thing was awful. Yeah, you gave Jeff a panic attack. You had to leave the room. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> it was awful. So, well, so yeah. So, um, so we're going to talk today about accountability. Basically, uh, helping you guys. Um, I mean, any clients that we work with, obviously, a, an objective that we try to do is help them understand the value of taking accountability. Um, and exploring the reasons why they wouldn't want to take accountability for their actions. Um, and then also help them identify any specific ways when they acted destructively, uh, particularly in interpersonal relationships, and then examine their behavior. Oh, that was <laughs> just powering off. turning off. So yeah. Don't worry. Um, Everything is turned off next to me. We're good. Yeah. But one of the things, that, and, and then the other thing is, is talking about the rationalization process that goes on in their own minds because a lot of people think that, um, lying sometimes is irrational, and and I think I think people have even said like the term you know that lying's a thinking error in and of itself. When yeah, it's listed as one, right? Lying by omission, lying by commission. Right. It's on that. It's right. On those what lists. are the different ways of lying? I always forget those. Lying commission and commission. What is and commission? What does that even mean? It means like you get. <laughs> it means you get money. a commission. Yeah, you yeah. get a free if you commission. Lie, you get money. If you get away with that lie, you get <laughs> extra money. <laughs> get five dollars off your polygraph. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's lying by omission. Light. There's like, but the omission, commission, and then some other assent. Lying by assent. What about I lying just, by dissent? Means just you let people assume what they think they already know. Yeah, you just agree with them basically uh, in those ways. But regardless, so, so you don't tell thing. the truth because, like, I assume because I told my therapist, my PO knows now. Is that what you're talking about? That'd be assent, probably. Yeah, lying Which by is omission a, is just like, well, you didn't ask me. Yeah, and yeah. then lying by commission is where you deliberately mislead somebody, like what most people think of when they lie or when they think of lying. Well, well, lying by assent is a little bit more specific than that. So imagine if I brought a client in and I started going through a PSI, right? Yeah. So if I started going through a PSI and I, and I read it back to you, and so I said, here's the, here's the narrative of the offense. But clearly that narrative had uh, a lot of components left out of it, right? So let's say, you know, so you're going through this and, and – um, and it said, you know, on, uh, on, on at least two occasions, um, you know, this, this, and that happened. And they are describing the offense, right? Whereas the client knew full well that it happened 14 times. So then they just agree with you oh. that, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That's accurate. So they're agreeing with you and, and that you've now read this and they are agreeing to that, even though you know more about that information that they're not doing. Mm -hmm. So you're, it's kind of like partial admission to the whole thing, uh, you know, by line by assent. Why is it called assent? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if that's, you know, I don't even know 
to be honest if that's accurate i've heard that before i mean but i don't even like it yeah well <laughs> well the thing is 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 that's 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 a big piece of this is is um getting caught up in all that nonsense it's like it's 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 pretty silly in a lot of ways because um when we uh when you get into the the research about this it's really it, it's pretty staggering why this is because a lot of people will say and this is where I've always for a, lo- a number of years thought that okay this person needs to be honest about this. Remember how we used to do polygraphs back how we were kind of trained to do those initially? So like, like the sexual history polygraphs. So when we were working with juveniles it was nuts, man. So they would say okay, you got to obviously disclose all your um so it was very similar to the original packet that we had. So we worked with a, a company <clears throat> And they would send us that, and, they, and then they'd list all their sexual contacts that they've ever had in their lifetime. And for juveniles, it was a little bit simpler because that list is a lot shorter. But then they would have to um, – but they would actually say if you've identified a victim that they wanted you to identify that person. And That's it, right. Right. Mm, wow. they, they, they would want you to identify that person. That's crazy. They made us into detectives. Right. And then we and, – and the objective there was if you didn't – if you didn't identify that person, you had no empathy – because you because that person needs services and, and the reason why you would identify them is not to get you in trouble, but because now they're going to um, they're gonna be able to the state is gonna pay for services for that victim, which is crazy as hell to me. And and I mean, to the juvenile justice court's credit, a lot of times they wouldn't bring additional charges onto that kid. Mm-hmm. Like they you know but Or they'd just run them concurrent as long as they completed therapy, then nothing no additional legal sanctions would happen. They'd still pick up a charge, but it would just be ran along with their original charge. Although I I mean, so if you imagine though if you came in like on a felony three, mm-hmm. right? And then you admitted to like ten felony ones. Right. Like you're, oh, they're just going to run that concurrent? Mm, I no, haven't, you're I mean, going, I haven't come across that one before. You're going, Probably not. You're going to Mill Creek, homie. Probably, like, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. there's no way, right? I guess they just never had that, but yeah, right. that would happen. Right, which is weird because that's, that's, I mean, the whole point of risk assessment is that despite the fact that those things happened, the index offense, what they're there for, is the only thing that matters because what, what, all, those, what all, those, all the research would bear out is that until they've had involvement in the criminal justice system and started doing the treatment, a lot of the stuff before, it's not that it doesn't count and it's not that it's not important, but, um, but it doesn't really, I mean, charging them with new crimes doesn't do anybody any good. And I, I know it sounds awful, but again, it if really the objective is though. to rehabilitate no. that person, then, and then it, giving them new crimes isn't going to do anything for them. No. And plus, you can't, you can't make people do, you know, there is a Fifth Amendment, you can't make people do that. So, right. Yeah, but so I mean, traditionally with accountability, it's this is something that, um, and hopefully, I think you've come around to this, haven't you, Jeff? Well, what, <laughs> so because Je- cause there's there's uh, a lot of this stuff is um, one of the things I, I pulled up here was I was talking about some commonly cited risk factors that are not currently supported in the research, and basically they uh, anybody who does the research on so this I says that. Well. Yeah, it says that factors uh, that are addressed should be used with extreme caution, and if at all, when formulating risk, because they don't really they don't really bear out on this. Okay. Be, well, because it's like this. Okay. <clears throat> it's like an it's pretty much an article of faith that offenders who deny their sex crimes are at a higher risk to reoffend sexually. Right. That's what I was taught for years. Well, right. Well, that makes sense, right? Because accountability. You think about the function of accountability. What right. is it? Well, to be open and honest, to get everything out on the table, and once you clear everything, <laughs> there's no more secrets, then the deviance is theoretically gone. Right. But, but so... With well, the account- idea is, like, I, I can't even move forward in treatment. No change will happen until I take accountability first. Like, that has to be the first step. Right. Right. Or no other steps will take place. Right. So, so, we, so we predict, and it's not a bad hypothesis, that... Once I come forward and be honest about my behaviors, that that's when true behavioral change can take place, right? There's some truth to that. And a lack <clears throat> of recognition of the problem would signal that I can't resolve the problem in the first place. I mean, the first if we're if we're talking about a problem solving model, the first step in problem solving is to identify that there's a problem, right? Right. Okay. But so this outward expression of accountability is where we get caught up. 
because we're requiring them as as a as a kind of a token to their success that outwardly they express this accountability to us that they have a come to Jesus moment so to speak with us and that they admit this to us and take accountability for this right but but think about that devoid of that if behavior change happened without accountability is the result still the same yeah if, if the if the change happened then if the behavior has been changed then it's been changed right yeah. so then it turns into that's where a lot of clinicians get hung up on this even our clinicians to this day i mean think of how many posts that we get when we're talking about treatment team issues and they're asking well, hey, what if he's not telling the truth, right? And I, I, so I said, well, I'm part of them. For a while, who cares? Who cares if they're not admitting to anything, you know? Like, who, I mean, if, they, if they're not admitting to that, um, that could be a number of things. And sure, could it be that they don't want to admit that they have a problem and they're not going to work on that problem? You bet. Of course, that could happen, right? But, I, but it's not a necessarily an indicator that they're going to be, um, that they're going to now not take account of not make behavioral changes and continue to be dangerous and deviant and you know apt themselves to reoffend. Right. Well, yeah, I, I think a lot of the reason that we place such an emphasis on accountability. Well, I, don't know, I, I could tell a little story from when a few years ago. So to work at the halfway house, remember that stupid training we had to go to out at that field house. Oh yeah, thing that yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically that wasn't stupid at all. I love the trainings that Utah Department of Corrections puts on mm. every time. Yeah, I guess the <laughs> opening message by one of the people was that that he told a joke to lighten the mood, and just kind of told that classic like, "How do you know if a sex offender is lying?" And, right, right. Well, you you know the answer to this. What's the answer? His lips are moving. There you go. Yeah, and and so kind of there's this general idea that's kind of always persisted that when clients lie, it's because they're actively scheming and they're setting up new offenses and they're and they're actively being predatory, and that the reason they're they're lying is so they can continue this covert operation of setting up a new sex offense, and that probably happens, but. There's a lot more, I think, just hum- like <laughs> very human reasons for lying, like wanting to avoid shame and embarrassment, uh, fear of consequence, fear of rejection, uh, fi- the potential of facing new charges, disappointing loved ones. So like a bunch of things that, well, the reasons that we all lie, you know, I lie, I have lied for some of those same reasons, you know, and I think, I, th- I think uh, when we stop looking at our clients as though they're constantly plotting their next offense. And that's the reason that they're maybe being deceptive and looking at it more just like, Oh yeah, they're, they're people and they lie for the same stupid reasons that we do becomes easier to humanize them and to, to, to not get so caught up on them saying the exact right thing that we need to say their exact right way about what their PSI says. Well, not only that is it, if, pounding like in that kind of a moment like pounding the truth out of someone well is that about them or is that about me wanting to hear something? like how's that helping my client if just oh i got him to say that certain words out loud okay cool i feel good about myself i think especially in like with court order stuff like people going through like for the forensic side of things is they're probably so used to that anyways like whether it's from peers or like in group or therapists in some like uh programs to I don't, I'm not a fan of how they approach things. And then, of course, their POs, that's what they're used to. So if they go into the therapy, someone that's supposed to be kind of on my side, and they drill me too. It's like, okay, this is all I'm going to get, so I just need to kind of play the game and then just be done. I don't think that promotes any kind of... Dude, if, if, we're, if we're working towards legit accountability. Like any type like, of long-term change at yeah, that point. Yeah, they're right. just going to think, oh, no matter where I go, what, and, and not, not that that's knocking like a PO. That's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to try to you know, finagle, like change with, you know, that's not their job. So they're going to, of course, approach things a little more black and white. But if it they go into treatment where you're supposed to talk with a therapist and they're doing the same thing, like, I don't know, that just seems so bizarre to me because you should have a place to go where I'm not going to be just constantly pounded about, are you telling the truth? Are you lying? It's just like, I've been guilty of that. I'll be the oh, first yeah, me to too. admit. Like, for whatever reason, I, I, I just feel better yeah. when my client just owns their offense and they're up front and it's kind of like, all right, cool. I don't have to worry about this guy as much, which might not even be the case. There might, who knows what else? Well, I could be, I could be speaking for you here, but from personal experience, I do feel better when a client does that, but it's more of like, I feel good for them. Like 
that has yeah, no, to be a relief. That has to feel good. It's a combination. It, I, yeah. it's, I feel good for them getting to pass them, especially when they pass the sexual history polygraph. But I also just sort of feel like, all right, so the, the biggest hurdle is over. I've, 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 I've been able to help them work through and take accountability for their offense all downhill from here. And that's probably not true. But it, it's been something that I've kind of personally had to work through because mm, it yeah. just feels like it. Well, so, so the thing is, is, is part of this as therapists, and this is some, sometimes what I like about this is we kind of introduce clients to the idea of understanding the difficulties of telling the truth, which you've pretty much done, right? But, I mean, check this. So look at this. Listen to this. Check it, check it. <clears throat> So it says, uh, uh, like, this is this is where the research comes in, and this is kind of, this is crazy. I mean, as you hear this, this is nuts. It says, offenders who deny that they were present at the time of the assault, who deny that, their, that the interaction was at all sexual, or who deny that the sexual interaction was assaultive, for example, uh, maintaining that it was consensual between peers, are often judged to be high risk until they can begin to acknowledge their offenses in some capacity. What are you so, reading this from? So this is from this is from a risk assessment instrument that basically is going over commonly cited risk factors that are currently uh-huh. not supported by research. Um, and so then it goes on and says, indeed, all of the available risk prediction checklist guidelines list denial of the sexual offense as a high risk marker. So even ours, the Sex Offender Treatment Intervention Progress Scale, suggests that if if the client is not taking responsibility for their offense. Um, that that we're going to score them in one way or another. So even even though the even though that so again we still feel like it's a good idea, right? Yeah. But then it goes on. It says um, the available research indicates that on the contrary, sex offenders who deny their sexual crimes are not more likely to reoffend sexually. Further analysis of the va- available file data. Uh, from recent study revealed that those who deny their sexual assaults were significantly less likely to reoffend sexually. Think about that. <laughs> when I deny my my it's offense, so I'm less stupid. likely to reoffend. Yeah, I have a tough stupid time. Like, I believe it, but I have a tough time. Like initially, just right. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and you can't claim that unless they're unless that that's that's true, right? I mean, they're they're throwing out the stats and everything. I mean, I can quote who these people are. It, it took it took you about three years to finally convince me to come around to that whole concept. Right. Like I remember, I remember years back at a training. It was even with Burton. Is that the eye patch dude? Yeah. Stud guy. I, I like listening to him. But we, we were at a training for him, and you had said something to me about that, and he also took a shit on the assault cycle. Yeah. It's like, what are you? No, what you you are treading over time tested. Like sex offender treatment stuff, and I don't know. I dug. I guess. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I dug my heels in forever. Uh-huh. Uh yeah. Well, so this around. is the thing. So you, we cited in here, and <laughs> this, this is, sucks. This is what we try to do. So accountability and responsibility are two different things. Accountability is actually kind of a trap at times um, because it, it's actually kind of dangerous, in my opinion. Because here's what happens: if I come into you as a, as you're my therapist and, and I'm your client, so I come in and I say, Jeff, man, God, dude. Um, and let's say I've been in aftercare or, or I've been in treatment for three months. Everything's going really swimmingly, right? And you ask me, you know, how are things going this week? And I say, real Man. quick, mention what aftercare is if someone. Doesn't oh yeah, sorry. Is. So so we just have two different des- designations. I mean, you're either an inpatient, and then once you complete inpatient or you do t- treatment in prison, and you transition to the community, they call that con- aftercare, and it's now called continued care. Um, but then also, um, if you're just an outpatient treatment, so we'll say I'm programming, right? It's kind I'm of doing, tapering off. It just right. kind of helps yeah. the client keep the wheels on the bus. So let's say I'm in, I'm three months deep into my outpatient treatment episode with you, and you ask me how are things going. I'm I'm approaching my I, I know I'm coming up my my sexual history polygraph, and you ask me I say you know what man I I before we get into this I just have to be honest with you. I, um, you know, this last week I was really down. I'm really lonely. I, you know, I haven't been able to get a job, this, that, and the other. And, um, I was searching on YouTube and I watched this video and it was really enticing. And then before I know it, you know, I, I pulled up a porn site and started looking at porn and I, and I masturbated to it. I looked at it like the next day too, but, and then I stopped and I realized I shouldn't have done that. And so, you know, so that's it, man. I, I, I I really need to talk about this because I don't know why I did that. It was kind of weird. And then we go. Now, as a therapist, how does that make you feel? Conflicted. On one hand, I'm I look at it as a sign of progress that the dude's willing to come out and be open about something that he's struggling with. Uh, on the flip, on the of course, the negative flip side is he's doing something that he's not supposed to. 
So a little conflicted, but in terms of therapy, it feels good that he's opening up because now we have a chance to identify the problem and work on it. It comes right back around to this, what we're talking about here. So it you, still feels good. So it's a violation, yeah, right? It's a violation. That's the part I don't like. Now, and as a violation, there's going to be some sort of sanction. Now, as you report this to the PO, right, w- I mean, what what's your recommendation for the sanction going to be? All right, be? here's usually what I'll say. So if if someone came to me and they spelled it out exactly as you did, what I usually tell the probation officer is, hey, look, so yeah, this is a violation, it's a problem, but here's the deal. Since since uh, John Doe was honest with me, that that tells me that he's he's workable, he's amenable to treatment. And so, again, since he's honest, I don't want him to get hit too hard. Here's how we're going to approach this. We're going to tackle this problem by doing blah, blah, blah. But I'll typically stick my neck out a little bit for the client when I'm talking to the PO saying that, Due to due to John, if that's what we're calling him, due to his honesty, he's he's workable. He's amenable to treatment. Right. So, and that makes sense, right? Guys are talking about their issues, are coming through. Okay, but look what you've done for me now. You've now given me like a golden ticket, right? Yeah. And I've ne- you've now taught me, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong, because if you hit me too hard, then what you're telling me is, like, if I'm honest, you're going to consequent me so roughly that I'm not going to want to come forward with you. I get punished for when I'm honest, but. If I'm not legitimately taking responsibility for my actions, well, now I've just learned a trick. I've learned a trick that I can do the things that I want to do and come to you and tell you about it, and it's going to be labeled as amenability. It's going to be labeled as progress. Clean slate. I can do it again. Now, the mileage is going to run out on that, of course, right? You're not going to let me get away with that perpetually, but I don't know that. I, I, I just continue to come in, and so this is kind of this accountability trap. So accountability without behavior change is just manipulation. That's sure. all it is, yeah, right? right? So again, you look at the responsibility piece of this, and responsibility is, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for my decisions. And, my, and responsibility, I, I always like the example, um, I, I think I read this in that, um, that Mark Manson book, the, the Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, that, right? Does that mean didn't read it? Oh, it's a good book. Anyway, right. you should read it. So he says, he says, it's not so blame is kind of a weird thing. You shouldn't be, I mean, bl- it's talking about blame and fault. It's silly. Responsibility is much more measurable. And, and how are we defining that? So, it, so you can say, so look at our clients' offenses, right? What I always try to tell them is you're not 100% to blame for your offense. You are responsible for your behaviors, and that's all you have to be responsible for, okay? But think about this. If, if you woke up tomorrow, like Justin, if you woke up tomorrow and there was a baby on your doorstep, right? Okay, you didn't do anything to put that baby on your doorstep, did you? No. No, right? Not that but, I know of. But you're, resp- <laughs> you're responsible for it now, are you? aren't you? Yeah. Right. You can make – so you're responsible for if you leave that baby – um, to die in the cold or whatever, you're responsible if you, if you, um, if you take that baby to the to the uh, fire station. You're responsible if you take that baby to an orbit, or you, if you keep it and take care of it. You're now responsible for something that was not your fault, and you're not to blame at all, right? So and this it gets is thrown at you in a way, right? Yeah, exactly. So the one thing we try to say here is responsibility is different. If I deny my offense and um, there's a client we work with at the halfway house right now, older guy, um, and he he right. said his offense never happened. It didn't happen at all. It did not happen. And what what the the victim said about this did not happen. But he takes a high level of responsibility because he pled guilty to a charge. He was offered a plea deal, right? And of the two plea deals, he took an option that he felt was in his best interest because if it went to trial, he could have been in prison for you know. A really long time, 20 plus years. And he said, well, so I pled to it and I'm now responsible for my decision that I pled to this and I'm going to do the therapy as much as I need to. And it still applies to me. Everything still applies to me. I, even though I never touched that girl sexually, I could have made a thousand different decisions that led up to this girl being able to accuse me of something that I didn't do. And I have to take responsibility for that too. And I was like, good for you, man. That's excellent. One way or another, he's setting the stage to change behaviorally regardless of whether or not he's admitting to the charge that he was in for. He's he's identifying a bunch of different decisions brought me to this point that put me into a position to where she was able to accuse me. So if I change these situations, I'm not going to be in these situations and ultimately as therapists, that's what we're looking for. They make those changes in their life and don't offend or put themselves in a position to be accused again. Right. So, so 
we do want them to take responsibility because that that's critical. If I so if denial is keeping me away from even taking responsibility to even taking steps forward to address the behavior that got me there in the first place and make be- behavioral changes, well then we have a problem. That's when denial matters, okay? If if I if I say no that never happened and it certainly didn't happen the way the PSI wrote it, I just kind of ask, well, who cares? Who cares if he admits to every little detail of that, or he does an eight-point disclosure, or he even tells me anything of that matter? As long that as is a behavioral very change. controversial opinion of not making them say what the PSI says. Well, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> again, the PSI was not written in their favor. That was written. That was written for. Um, you know, uh, well, the PSI obviously is, you know, this is the, it was written for sentencing is what it was written for, right? I'm not saying people are inaccurate. I'm not saying PSI writers are corrupt. What I'm saying is they use the information that they had from all sides, right? But again, that's not his version of the events. And the, the more I try to force another version of the events onto this client, right? Well, again, if I don't believe in something, but I know that I have to do it in order to get through it, then how meaningful is that to me in the end? Well, I mean, not much. It, right. It, it, other than the fact that you get what you what you came for. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, tell me a lie, I guess. Well, I mean, think about think about w- when you were and, and a, a great example of this is: Did you ever take a college class or college course that? You did not want to go to, but you took it because you had to because it was a prerequisite or there was no other options. Social yeah. psychology okay. ended up getting me into this career field. <laughs> <laughs> so so think about this. If there if there aren't any if there if you go to a class, I remember there was a, a, a bunch that I had to take. I had no interest in them in whatsoever. I don't remember anything from those classes. Nothing. And I apply nothing from what I learned of those classes to what I do now. I'll give you an example. I did international social work. Other than that my cohort there's two other people who totally bailed on their research project and it didn't help me other than that i don't remember anything that i did in that group because i don't care about international international social work but i i did what i was told to do because i needed to get a good grade right that's what these guys are doing if i don't care if i'm not committed to it if i don't believe in what i'm doing well then i'm just going to do it and you're going to give me a good grade good enough for me to be dumb but i'm not going to apply anything you that told is me not what we want our clients right doing. exactly yeah. so so again I'm not going to appease them and say, no, you, you didn't do it. You didn't do anything wrong, right? There's a discussion that has to be had there that says, well, man, that's amazing. Like, you get this happened. Okay, I'm going to roll with this, and I'm going to see where this – what could you have done differently? What were some decisions you made to allow that to happen and uh, that this girl could accuse you of this? Like, how is that even possible? When you start getting it down to that, that's a really good conversation. I was going to say, once the dude answers that question, you've got buy-in with him because now he's, he's actually given – his take on the matter. So now he, he has stake in it. He has a vested interest. It's not international social work. It's it's direct clinical practice in his in his thing. It's something he's actually interested in. Right now we can get actual behavioral change that a year from now, five years from now, hopefully ten, hopefully lasts and persists. Well, he'll also feel like you actually want to hear what he has to say. You're not making him parrot what a document says. Mm-hmm. Right. So. That I, I'm telling. I mean. I when I was giving Mace crap and saying uh, that's a very controversial opinion to make the client parrot back what was on the pre sentence investigation. I mean, obviously, I agree with Mace on that. It's just that's how it was done forever. Well, yeah. Is that you? If, if you as a client did not toe the line and admit to exactly what was on the PSI, you risked being kicked out of treatment. And so mm. that I mean that. Well, I guess that leads to the problem that Mace just articulated. So. Well, yeah. So again, why can't clinicians just be patient with it, right? Just So I'm just going to calm down, and I'm going to observe this guy's behaviors. And, and in three months from now, if he's off the rails, okay, there's clearly a problem, okay? Um, but, I mean, how many times has a client been fully accountable to their offense because they know what we want to hear? Again, Accountability without behavior change is just yeah. manipulation. Well, that, and that's that's the thing too. That's that's usually what happens for me if, when I have someone that comes in just starting out and they're gung ho. I did all this. Yep, yeah, ready to go. I immediately just think, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, let's just keep working on assignments and stuff. Like, 
not to say that that's right. bad if they do it, they want to be open, but to me, it just sounds like a, I'm going to practice this phrase, and as soon as I sit down with my therapist, I'm going to say this so I look good, and that's yeah. usually what I hear, not to say I don't want someone to do that, but right. it's just saying, just like someone might deny it right off the bat, if they're like gung-ho taking accountability, I'm also taking that with a grain of salt, because I'm like, well, you're just saying what you think you need well, to say. What about when they say all the therapy words, like, you know, I've just really done a lot of work on my deviant sexual scripts, and <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of my assault cycle, and I just want to let you know I'm fully accountable to my treatment and you know this is uh this takes number one priority in my life i'll tell you what it's like yeah. oh shut up yeah well, i Man. was like okay let's yeah. start this session over. I, lo- <laughs> yeah. I love like when you're in group therapy and you just ask kind of a general question and somebody just empathy <laughs> yeah. like, just yep. throwing out words <laughs> assault cycle <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah dude uh, yeah. but but think about this like this is where <laughs> this is where another buzzword i mean do you guys ever use the do you guys ever use the term thinking error anymore I, I I do yeah just but not really for a long time not like I used to it used to be part of the curriculum so le, so you know? let me let me pitch this to you on this so if you think about this this is the problem that I have with this so they have they they use like thinking error or stinking thinking or something like cognitive that. distortion I've right. never heard that one I hate that yeah already. stinking thinking is awful stinking because it's just so thinking. stupid but <laughs> I think it's um, an AA thing <laughs> so so here's here's the problem with this say, stink if I thinking. say so stinks. an error would imply what. A mistake. Right. That wrong. something was wrong, Whoa. right? That there's a value Whoa. judgment of right or wrong on the way that I think about things. But here's the problem with this. It's not really – it's not necessarily wrong, okay? So instead, what I love about like uh, the the uh, 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 cognum, the CBISO, the stuff from Cincinnati, the stuff that uh, that sainted Sarah Botner taught us. <laughs> Dreams love you, Sarah. Of. Yeah. <laughs> so is that they call it common risky thinking. Because think about this. Okay, so let's just say a client tells you that exact story that, you know what, part of this is because I was too nice and I let this girl come into my home and I shouldn't have done that. I should have recognized that. And she was only out for money and and eventually she accused me of this. There was no forensic evidence and then I just had to cop to a plea. Okay, so we're taking this guy at his word. Well, uh, so some of those risky thinking, right? And a lot of people might say there that that statement is fraught with thinking errors, right? And the and the traditional terminology of a thinking error would say, yeah, sure it is. But they would say denial, minimization, sure. blame shifting. Right. They'd say all those thinking errors. But if if this is the case, if I'm looking at this, so I have a list here from CB from the um, Cincinnati curriculum, and it says, um, and it says, uh, you know, the victim hates me the victim is trying to get financial compensation. This is post-offense risky thinking, right? Okay, those two statements, the victim hates me, the victim is trying to get financial compensation. Those could both be true. Those could both be factually accurate, right? So to say that it's wrong, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me something that I know is absolutely true, and you're telling me it's wrong. You're looking more outcome-based, right? Like, what will this type of... If I choose to think this, what will the outcome be? Right. right. So think so about that. So it's not necessarily what's so, right or wrong, true or false. It's just where like, where will this le- way of thinking most likely lead me? Correct. Think about that. So if I maintain that thought, right, wrong, or indifferent, if that's, if that's an accurate statement, if the victim literally does hate me and the victim is trying to get financial compensation, that's totally true... But I maintain that type of thinking. What could that lead to? Resentment and blowing off treatment. And, right. I'm yeah. going to disengage. I'm going to say this stuff doesn't apply to me. So again, the pitch to the client is this. Look, you, it's, it's not a thinking error. It's not right or wrong. It's risky or it's not risky. It's risky to maintain that type of thinking, not because I think you're going to go reoffend. It's risky because I think you're not going to engage in treatment. And and I don't want you to and I don't want you to I want you to engage in treatment. I want you to no longer be involved in the criminal justice system. So again, this is about you. Their best interest, the Re- client's best interest. Right. How could you not buy into that as a client? Well you would because you're way less likely to look at it as defensive. I I mean it it takes I got to be pretty good at it, but it, it's it's tough to point out thinking errors in a client without them getting defensive, putting walls up and not hearing shit that you have to say. You know, I, I, but you don't want to call it a thinking error. You no, I know. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, like, like I, I have a hard time. Like, thinking error automatically says, well, what's wrong with the way I'm thinking? You're automatically accusing them of doing something wrong. So to to be able to finesse that to the way that they're actually going to open their ears and listen rather than be like, oh, God, what am I doing wrong now? It's tough. The, the, the approach you're taking makes it in their best interest to change because we're looking at outcomes rather than you made an error in thought. You made a cognitive distortion. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Know. So well, it, it, ma- it takes away the label of right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Uh, so again, what we try to say, and we list these here, these accountability barricades as we start talking about these. And I mean, they're just defense mechanisms that my mind, my mind naturally goes to to kind of make me okay with what I've done, okay? So, it, and not like, not in a in a way that I like saying I'm going to do it again, just that I don't have to deal with a lot of the emotional turmoil that comes from this. Now, now again, if if when we talk about the offense and they experience that emotional turmoil, good. That just signals that they have a conscience and that they give a shit, right? Right. Okay, great. But again, if I'm saying I'm using a minimization, so on here we have listed it, it, it was only once, other people have done way worse. Some of the curriculum from Cincinnati says um, it didn't happen the way that, as often as the victim claimed. I didn't use any threats or coercion or force. The, ins- the incident was less sexually intrusive than the victim claimed. All of those things could be totally true. Right. And and to label it a thinking error again, and I know it's semantics, but I can't help but think that's no, important, right? As a client, you're telling me the way that I'm thinking is incorrect. It's not incorrect. That's factually accurate. And I would just say, look, what you're saying may be totally true, but it doesn't make it not risky. Okay, so so just because it's true doesn't mean it's not risky. It can still be true and risky at the same time. Risky being that their focus is on that. Correct. Because yeah. if I if I continually tell myself that, well, again, uh, so I, uh, I have to acknowledge and take responsibility for the things that I've done. And until I do that, uh, that's where I'm not going to make any changes. And I just say, okay, so what the PSI said was not accurate. That's fine. But I'm not going to maintain that thought, again, because I'm not going to likely engage in treatment. I'm going to look at this stuff and instantly say it doesn't apply to me when it very well does. And and then I can apply these things and move forward to these things and I, just be honest about those things. I have a guy I'm working with right now, one of my outpatient guys, that he, he hangs his hat on that change in thinking for him being one of the biggest turning points. He used to forever be the other people have done way worse. These people in group aren't like me. I can't relate to anybody in here. You, he ended up turning the corner, figuring that out on his own, and he says for him, therapy has got has become so much easier when he stops worrying about what other people are doing. But the thing is, like, if we're looking at it, and again, this isn't something we say often to clients, but if you're going to look at it on paper, most people would agree that his offense is not what other people's offense is. Sure. So he was factually correct in saying other people have done way worse. But w- once he decided to stop focusing on that, uh, his levels started coming one after another, and yeah. he stopped. He was able to progress. He was he wasn't perpetually just stuck in stagnation, feeling sorry for himself. Yeah. So in that sense, what you're saying bears itself out perfect with this guy I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I, and I know we're I know we're um, close on time here. The one thing I'd say though, um, and I don't know if you guys hear. I mean, how often do you guys hear that in groups? Like, I don't relate to these other guys. Well, of course. Often. Well, it's funny. Yeah. Every yeah. guy says that. Like, not every guy, but like that's usually. I think they're totally different. And they all say, "Well, I can't relate." Have I'm you? Not have like you? These guys. Have you ever asked why? Like, w- what does that matter? Like, have you ever put the guy on the spot and say, "Okay, so you really are outspoken about this," and I and I usually use this analogy. I usually say, "Okay, so I understand. I understand that you want to make sure that other people know that you're not, you know." Um, you, that your sexual um, behaviors are not consistent with what you what you define to not be appropriate, right? I, I said so again. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a heterosexual male, and nothing against my you know gay buddies. What I'm saying is though, is if you if you put me on a on an island where only gay people lived, I'd make sure everybody knew I was heterosexual. I'd be like, hey, I, I'm I'm not gay, right? I just yeah. make sure everybody knew that. Not because not because I'm trying to like you know, be mean or anything like that. I just, I want to be able to identify that my sexual You're taking behavior. yourself out of the dating pool. Right. It's yeah. not, I'm not saying your sexual behaviors are bad. I'm saying my sexual behaviors are not consistent with yours. Is that's right. it. Okay, so I get that. And I say, so that, I understand what you're saying. But really, so what's what's the, the concept of you feel like you can't relate to people, right? Have you ever done that? I mean, what, no, I haven't. What What's the real reason or what's the reason that they would offer So what do you suspect they that? answer when I when I ask them that question? What? When I ask, well, like, what do you think they say when I say, why, why are you so concerned whether or not you can relate to these guys? And, and their primary... I'm just an- not like these guys? Their primary know, answer is they feel like they're not going to get anything out of group. And what, so essentially what they're saying oh, is... Actually, yeah, okay. If I can't relate to you, I can't learn from you, which clearly is horse shit, right? I mean, because, because again... That's I don't, accurate. I don't relate to a lot of people. I... 
I've never committed a sexual offense, but I teach my clients a lot of stuff. So because I can't relate to you, you can't learn from me. Okay, mm-hmm. spot on. Clients right. do say that piece. Right. Yeah. So again, that's the piece is I say, well, I have to have direct empathy and have been in exactly the same offense to be able to relate to you, right? So, I mean, th- it's ludicrous. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to say I can't, I can't learn from you because I can't relate to you. Um, it's just, a, and again, that's just a, it's just a buffer for them, and it all, it all whittles down to that. You kind of get them on the, put them on the spot, and they're like, oh. oh, so, and I don't tell them they're full of shit, but I'm just saying, obviously, you're just saying that to kind of, okay, great, I'm, I'm glad that you, I don't want you to start thinking this way. I keep what you have, but I'm just saying you can still learn from these guys, and they can still learn from you. I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you're part of this group, but. I don't think that has any bearing on what we're trying to what we're trying to accomplish. You saying you can't relate to these guys? I'm going to try that approach. It works better than anything I've tried so far. One thing that I, I can't measure. I don't know exactly how many times. So what seems to work for me in that in that case, and it doesn't. It's one of those ones I look at. It doesn't necessarily work right out of the gate, but usually they kind of come around. Is I'll just kind of not a non confrontational approach. But when I have someone to say like, "Oh, it's a bunch of sickos and group of for you know people, I'm not like them. I shouldn't be in there," and I just say like. Well, it doesn't really sound like it's about the other people in group. It just sounds like you're you're trying to distance yourself from that as a way to to kind of feel better about yourself. Why do you think that is? And I just do they answer that? Usually, they <laughs> seem a little more deer in the headlights, but <laughs> yeah. almost almost every time, I swear, it comes around later where they're like, "Yeah, you know, like something." And it usually happens like something cool happens in group, or they kind of connect with somebody else, and then they'll come back kind of like. Yeah, we're all different, you know. It's we're in there for different stuff, and I, I like group now. You know, they they start they kind of come around on their it. on their own way. Yeah, but I just kind of say because in the end that's true. It's just their embarrassment and their own shame is just kind of saying it helps me to feel a little better right now if I kind of distance myself from what I see is a lot of stereotypes, and I don't want you to think that I'm like those guys when really I'm not thinking that at all. This is them thinking this about themselves. Mm. So it's just kind of saying, well, what's going on with you that's making you feel like? Which is kind of an obvious question, but it's it's redirecting of hey something's going on internally here rather than about the group, you know? yeah. So well, so wrap this I, shit up. yeah, I think that that's um, that's a good place to stop, man. I mean, like uh, so again, uh, for any of the uh, people listening to this, hopefully as therapists, this is helpful. Um, and again, isn't this this shit's on Facebook or something, right? Or it's going to be all over MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking. Well, no, we're not going to set up a MySpace. Where is this <laughs> happening anyway? Well, so I got a, I got a, it's a complicated process. But yeah, we'll have it up on like iTunes, and YouTube, that and all done that. Shit that to set yeah. It up yet. yeah, but I mean, like, if there's, there's going to be places to comment, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think. Um, well, so like follow us. So we'll have like a Facebook oh, set up. Yeah, there'll be like links to the podcast on there. The yeah. podcast itself isn't going to be on Facebook at that makes no, sense. No, no, yeah, that's I'm what I mean. Like, there'll be, a, there'll be a guerrilla oh, yeah, social yeah. work. That's thing. already up and going, yeah. People can say Switch. how bad they hate it. So, Twitter. yeah, so I think that um, if you if you struggle with this concept um, as, a, as a therapist, as a, a professional working with these people, I mean, I, I'd say first, just admit that you struggle with that and to some degree you probably disagree with us and that's okay um, because again like I think like uh, like Jeff said he, I think he held out for about three years till he came around to this which again I, I mean change is kind of weird if we've always done the same thing then in introducing this but I mean one of the I, I, what I would ask is just be open for a dialogue, um, you know, and be willing to kind of openly discuss that. But by all means, please comment on this, and I can give citations on some of the stuff that I was talking about earlier because that is kind of seems kind of crazy that some of those things exist, but they do. So by all means, go ahead and comment, and we'll uh, we'll discuss it further. But that's accountability kit barricades. So. Whoa, whoa! That is a wrap, everybody for. Episode 7 for the Gorilla Social Work Podcast. Went over accountability. Hope you enjoyed it. Coming up next, we are having a good one. Also, we are going to be talking about the harmful effects of pornography. Um, You might say, maybe, Justin, but I'm watching pornography right now. And I would say, if you're watching pornography and listening to our podcast, you're probably good at multitasking, but that's also just weird. So... It's cool, though. We'll talk about that in the next one. You should tune in. You should tune right in. And then check us out. Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, you name it. Check it out. Gorilla Social Work Podcast. We also want to make sure if you have questions, feedback, comments, whatever, 
please contact us if you have anything. We would love to hear from you. We would love to address questions, rude remarks, whatever you got for us. So next episode, check it out. We'll be talking about the harmful effects of pornography. And that is a wrap. And you enjoy your day. 